You're now watching the Danny Mac Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Welcome into the Danny Mac Podcast. I'm Dan McNeil. Glad you're with us. It is March Madness time, and that means you can earn money. Go to your Bet Rivers app today. Every time there's a men's or women's game in rounds one, two, the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, you make a three plus leg parlay, and you can earn the player boost. Who doesn't want that? Let's let's talk about the climate in Chicago right now as Brian makes an adjustment. And nobody adjusted better on the fly, by the way, than, than Brian Erlacher. How's that for a ham-handed segue? The, the Bears have transitioned. Justin Fields is a stealer. They get a sixth, maybe a fourth-round pick. I heard what you said Super Bowl week, and that's what I'd been saying. Copycat, uh, if you're still asking questions after three years, then there's your answer. I take it you're a thumbs up on parting ways with Fields and moving in another direction. Yes and no. You know, I, I think he, he, he shows some signs. I'll tell you what, man, there's some games I'm like, damn, this kid is good. And then there's some good times you're like, wow, you know, and, and you can say it's not a good offensive line. doesn't have a lot of receivers or weapons around him. But I do think he's going to be good. I'll say that. You know, uh, maybe not there because uh, we haven't had good quarterback play in Chicago in a while. Uh, dude, that's no secret. But I think he's going to – I think they obviously stole him for, what, six-round pick. Could be a fourth if he plays. Going to go get to sit under Russ for a year at least there in Pittsburgh. But, you know, if you have the number one pick two years in a row and you don't have a franchise quarterback – that's not good for your for your organization. You know, they have to get a franchise guy. Whether it was Justin, you know, or whatever it is, they, they needed to get a franchise guy or what they deem to be a franchise guy. They may not get him now, but they have to at least, I think, spend the pick on there. My wish was for them to keep fields, not not and and draft the quarterback at number one. And guys yep. say you can't do that. You can't have both of these yeah. guys in the same building. And I say that's crap. A strong willed coach could do that. Maybe they don't I, have the coaches who can handle that. You agree? I don't. I don't, dis- I don't agree with you about the coaches, but I, I don't disagree with you about having two quarterbacks. I think I think Justin was kind of settling in. They got a new OC this year who I like, and then maybe give Justin a year. And maybe the look, Green Bay's done a great job of getting their young quarterbacks ready to play. They sit them behind these great quarterbacks, and then they come in and they're successful. Um, you know, not saying Justin was great, but you maybe sit whoever they draft at one or two, wherever they, you know, if they trade the pick, they see what they get and um, and see what happens. But you know, it doesn't matter now. The idea of having him on the roster, you could put him on the field together. You you could play fields in the really slot, good. throw him bubble screens and let him do what he does best, run with the football. He would have been very cheap, but like you say, that's uh, that's just a dream. And Mike Tomlin may be the perfect guy to handle two big egos with Wilson and Fields. That's going to be fun to watch unfold. I, I, don't, I don't feel like Justin's a huge ego guy. I think he's confident. I don't feel like he's the guy, and this, I mean this in a totally good way, he's confident. But he's not, his ego doesn't like doesn't rub people the wrong way. I think it's going to be a great situation because um, Russell. I know people were down on him in, in Denver because they didn't win, but his numbers were good. If you're going by numbers, which is what the media loves to do, look at Russell's numbers, and they were good. Um, so just go off of that. But yeah, it's a good situation for both of them, I believe. And Tomlin is the freaking man. He's one one of the guys in the NFL I would love to play for. Yeah, I'm not surprised to hear that. And and you're right. Wilson was way more productive last year than a lot of people recognized. Uh, Maybe he's never going to be the same guy, but 80% of of Russell Wilson would be better than a lot of guys. I like the way you describe Fields. Confident and and maybe – Maybe cocky, but not in a bad way. Unlike yeah. unlike the guy who came in in zero nine, um, and immediately ingratiated himself to those of us Bears fans by throwing four picks on opening night at Green Bay when you uh, busted up your wrist. What is your relationship, yeah. if you have one, with Jay Cutler, Brian? I got no problem with Jay. We speak every once in a while via social media. I think Jay lives in Nashville. Um, but yeah, I, I I like Jay. He's a good dude. Uh, I know. I think he's doing some media stuff now. I don't watch a lot of NFL media junk. Uh, most of those guys are ex players. I don't really talk to anyway, so I don't uh, I don't watch a lot of that stuff. But yeah, it, I follow him on Instagram. He's he's a good follow. But um, other than that, we really don't talk that much. But I got I got I went on his podcast. I think a year or two ago. I had a good time doing that with him. We agree on a lot of the same things, which I I appreciate. Okay, give me an example of some things you agree on. Politically, we agree on a lot of things. We see eye to eye on politics. 
Okay, so Jay is a Trump enthusiast like you are. Does it bother so. you? I, I so- because, well, hold on. Just because we're on the same <clears throat> same side doesn't mean we're Trump enthusiasts. We just uh, we see things a certain way. Doesn't automatically mean we're big Trump guys. I am. I'm not sure if he is, but I believe we're on the right side of a lot of issues that a lot of people aren't on the same side of. Mm-hmm. We, we talked about this a little bit before we started rolling. And for everybody listening and watching, does it bother you there are Bears fans or just football fans, anybody who wants to distance himself right now from you because of your fondness for Trump? Well, I can really give a shit, to tell you the truth. I don't care what people think <laughs> at this point in my life. If you don't like me because of what I believe in politically, pissed off. I don't care. You know, at this point, I... I I've gone through so much shit the last two or three years listening to people talk about, oh, you like Trump, you're this, you're that. I don't care. I like what I like. You like what you like. That's your thing. Do it. I don't care. That's the way I feel about it now. I don't don't really give a hell anymore. Good. Good. That's a good place to be when you can arrive at that station in life. Um, Yeah. Fortunate you got there quicker than I did. Let's talk about Caleb Williams, a different type of pressure than the type you faced. You're the ninth pick in the first round 24 years ago. He's going to be the first and he's already banked. We've not banked, but he's earned $12 million. I don't think the New Mexico alums were that generous (laughs) to you. Um, yeah. What would you? What advice would you give him coming in here to handle to handle Chicago and to handle the expectations that are going to be on him? It's a little different for him, like you said. He he's got a lot more pressure than I did, um, and he's quarterback. You know, the number one pick in the draft, it's a big deal. But I think if he just goes in there and works and shows it, number one, earn the respect of your teammates. You know, I think that's a big deal because he probably will be the starter going in. They have nobody on the roster right now that's going to beat him out. Uh, so go in there. If if they draft him, we don't, I mean, who, who the hell knows what they're going to do? You know, uh, there's uh, there's three or four or five guys that could be there, right? And there's with the trades and stuff going on, and there's good quarterbacks everywhere. Anyway, but uh, yeah, I think number one, earn the respect of your teammates by working your ass off and going in there, being the first guy in the building, uh, say the right things in the media, and you know, just be humble and, and go in there and and put your head down and go to work. I don't claim to be educated enough to say which of the best, you know, who's the best of these guys. I don't watch enough. And even if I Thank did, I, I, I'm a, I'm an armchair ex high school jock. What do I know? Um, so you, you don't think you've watched enough to have a qualified opinion then? Is that what you just said? No, I haven't watched enough. I don't know enough about, all, you know, there's, there's experts for that. I'm not one of those guys. I love watching college football, man. I love it. I watched Caleb play. He did some things. I was like, damn, this dude is good. Then you watch. And it's just like every guy you're like, why do you do that? You know, I watched the Notre Dame game. My son's at Notre Dame, so I watched a bunch of their games. And he had, he struggled against that defense. The year before, he did not struggle against their defense. So, who knows? You know, sometimes you have bad days. Um, he's a very talented guy. I know that. Throwing the football, running around, he does some things that are, that are fun to watch. A lot like Justin Fields, but I think Caleb throws the ball better. With the additions of, of the wide receiver, Keenan Allen, who's going to be 32 when the season starts, and he's already missed 11 games the last couple of years. That's a bad position to be old at. Uh, but DeAndre Swift is here in the backfield. They got they DeAndre re- Swift? Yes, they got DeAndre Swift. They signed him oh. to a free agent deal. Okay. Uh, big year with Philly last year, but never yeah. really earned the affection Huge of fan. the Lions staff. You are a Huge big fan of him. I think he's a badass. He was a badass in college. He was a badass at Detroit when they got rid of him for some reason. He was a badass at Philly. So I don't see that. I don't see that badass factor going down any less while he's in Chicago. You know, I think they're going to. If they have a rookie quarterback, they're going to need to run the football. Uh, and they they still have um, twenty four. Uh, I don't remember I don't know, the other running back. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not good with the Bears players' names right now. Um, twenty four. Khalil Herbert. Herbert. That Khalil Herbert too. and Roshan Johnson, the uh, fourth Roshan rounder Johnson from a played year ago. Great towards the end of the season as well. So they got three guys that can carry the load if, if they can run the football. Those three guys are, are three solid guys. But DeAndre Swift is a beast, and Herbert's a badass as well. They should be a playoff team if their first if the number one pick is any damn good. There's no excuse for them not to be a playoff team, is there? I, I don't know. Their defense is good. Their their conference. I mean, I'm sorry. Their division's tough. You mm-hmm. know, you, I I don't disagree with you, but their division's tough. And here's the thing that that bothers me about you know getting rid of Justin. One of the things that I thought about is like, so you get rid of Justin, and now you have a, co- a coach who's probably on the hot seat. I would say because last year everyone was talking about fire him, which I don't dis- I don't I don't agree with. By the way, I think he's done a good job with what he's had, but you got a rookie quarterback coming in. And you got a coaches on the hot seat. You don't win a lot of games with a rookie quarterback. You, obviously, Chris or CJ Stroud's different. That dude w- was great last year. 
and the Bears could have drafted him, but they didn't. Anyway, um, so you, you look at that, and, and you got a coach who's on the hot seat with a rookie quarterback. You may not have a great season. If your quarterback doesn't play out of his mind, you may not have a great season. So it's kind of a tough spot to put your, your coaching staff in. And Eberflus in year number one was in a tank here, too. I mean, they, they weren't really building the roster for him to win. So that was that was a handicap a lot of people have have overlooked. The the two GMs yeah. who preceded Ryan Poles really are the reason I think this is such a mess. It's the old cliche, Brian, be careful what you wish for. Uh, Jerry Angelo did some goofy things, but he did some really good things here well, as Jerry well. Jerry Angelo and then- was the man. I have so much. Jerry didn't get enough credit for what he did. He built our defense. We we were he built our team. Sorry, I should say team. I, D, Lovey was a defensive head coach. That's where Jerry wanted to spend his money, and that's what we did. We were great on defense. We may have struggled on offense at times, but that's the way it was going to be. And we knew that because that's what we were a defensive team. Our coach, our head coach, was a defensive guy. Our GM understood that. That's where we built. So that's the way it goes. <clears throat> I like Jerry as well. He he rolled dice on Tommy Harris with a knee at 14 in the first round. And a lot of guys said he's nuts. And, you know, for a couple yeah. years, Tommy was as good as any guy inside in the league. Uh, Thomas Jones was a great pickup. And then he botched that on the back end by picking Cedric Benson over Thomas Jones. Now, there's a situation where two guys should have been in the, able to be in the building at the same time. Jerry said when he let Jones go is I couldn't keep them both. Why the F don't not? Draft Cedric. Don't, well, I just say don't draft Cedric. Um, so in my opinion, Thomas was not on the decline. We're coming off the Super Bowl. No, he has his first year there, or his second year, he has like 12, 1,300 yards. Super Bowl year, he does great. And then, you know, my, my answer to that question is don't draft Cedric the year before. You know, you know we didn't need him. We had, t- we had TJ. You know, then you can find a backup guy to get the carries. But TJ was carrying the low for us. He was awesome. Nothing against Cedric. Uh, he, he did a good job for us when Thomas left, but um, it just we didn't we didn't need him. You know, Thomas was the man. But I think Lovey had a pretty high fondness for what Cedric did in college. Yeah, I think he did too. Was was your affection Lance Briggs' affection for Thomas Jones part of the reason you gave Benson such a rough ride when he finally got to camp after a holdout? I had no issue with Cedric, and I had no issue with any of my teammates. I had no problem with that. Business is business. You do that on your own. We'll take care of the team while you're, until you get here. But we had no problem with that. I had no problem with Cedric. He, we didn't talk to him a lot. He was just different. He had a different personality, which is fine. Some guys are like that. Um, Thomas was the dude. We were drafted the same year. But TJ was a team leader. He was vocal. He said shit that needed to be said. And we all respected him and looked up to him for that. So when he left, it was like, damn, man. We lost not only a great player, but a great leader as well. So it was tough. Yeah, I remember sitting in the uh, the trailer, the ESPN trailer in Bourbon A, and Cedric Benson was sitting waiting to do an interview when we were in a seven or eight minute commercial break. Brian and I said, apologize for the wait. You know, got to get the sponsors. And he goes, yeah. I don't have anybody else to talk to. I, I don't have anywhere else to go. Really? <laughs> he was really lost in a Bears uniform. He just, like I said, he, he was just – uh, different personality. I, I mean, he was talented as hell. I mean, you, when he got the ball, you could see he got downhill in a hurry. But just he, he started out, you know, kind of on the wrong foot there with everything going on with TJ and kind of never turned around. He did some good things in Cincy. I know when he, when they played the Bears that one year, he had a, a good game. I was out that game, by the way, but he did. Oh, he I know. Yes, I wrote songs about it when I went back to the score about who'll yeah. stop the run. It was a Creedence Clearwater revival song because Benson ran for, I think, 172 yards. Yeah, I watched it on TV. I was, I was hurt. That's the year I hurt my wrist, so I watched it on TV. But, yeah, he had a good game against us. Yeah. All him. right. Better, me- better him. memories. Um, among Jerry yeah. Angelo's greatest hits, selecting Devin Hester. He's going into the Hall of Fame. Are you going yeah. to Canton for the party? I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I haven't been back since I got inducted, but this will be the year to go. Right. We got three bears going in. Julius, Devin and Mongo. Finally. So I uh, if, if I if I ever go back, this will probably be the year to go. Did you so get to know Mongo? I knew him. You know, just meeting him around town and, and you come to the locker room sometimes. I'm, a, I'm very fond of Mongo, even prior to everything that's been going on. He's always a great personality, always very nice to me, um, <clears throat> respectful, just uh, a ton of respect for him. It's cra- It's terrible what he's been going through the last few years, but it's good to see him get his due. We shouldn't have taken this long for him to get into the Hall of Fame. He should have been in. You talk to the guys in the 85 team, they all say he's probably the best D-lineman on the team. You know, he didn't have the stats some of those guys had, but he was one of the better guys in that defense. 
Bears coaches graded him consistently uh, as high as anybody. He was always one or two, occasionally three, when they graded the film. Of course, that's Bears coaches grading film. Sometimes you had 27 tackles uh, on Monday morning. That's the way it should be because the NFL screwed me every damn game. I'd, have, I'd leave the game like, oh, man, I feel like I probably had 9, 10, 11 tackles this game. Look at the stats, three. I'm like, what the f- I could count three in the first quarter. So, and then and Coach Babbage was was a dick. When he graded our film, he was not easy on us linebackers. You know, you didn't get the jump on piles. You didn't get that shit. You had to make a tackle while the guy was standing up and actually tackle him. There's no jump on piles. Oh, there's an assist. Uh uh-uh. uh. You make the tackle. That's how you get a tackle. Pile jumping is how Eddie Jackson got his uh, his checks. Uh, <laughs> for the, I'm so glad to see him gone, man. Nobody ever prospered more. For a one-game performance in his career, that was the game when the Bears beat Carolina in 2017, no, Foxes a, his, last his year. rookie year or second year, he had like two or three or four or five pick sixes, right? He was unbelievable. He had a 75-yard pick six in the same game. He had a 76-yard fumble return. That's a game oh, nice. where, uh, yeah, that was a game when Trubisky went four of seven for 104 yards and the Bears beat Carolina. It was, and then That's he got paid. Be. That's good defense. <laughs> Yeah. Good defense there, Dan. Good job. Yeah. Good job, Mitch. But I mean, these these guys who play safety today in these corners, and you know, you're past 45 now, so you can be old man yells at cloud. Right. They don't yeah. get their shoulder pads underneath, guys. They don't know how to form tackle. What has happened to the Mike Browns of the world, man? Well, they don't want to get thrown out of the damn game for hitting somebody. That's what happened. The game changed. They're not allowed to hit anymore. Not only can they not touch the guy, play, the cor- I don't know how the corners play defense anymore. Watching it as a holding or illegal contact, every if it's third and 11, they're going to be a defensive penalty. Just get ready for it. Whether it's roughing the passer when he gets a sack. How, how do you get roughing the passer when you sack a guy? I don't understand that. The ball is in his hands and you sack him and they call roughing the passer. There's so many rules that are swayed toward the offense. It's so hard to watch, but – Going back to the defense, guys, the corners and the safeties, I don't know how they play defense anymore because they can't hit guys. They can't touch them. They can't grab their – you can't do anything. So, I um, I don't know. I think the rules changing are uh, really impacting the guys in the back end because they got to watch where they hit these guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is an issue, and roughing the passer, protecting him on his way down is is the one that I'm getting quite a kick of. Chris Jones is supposed to control his 295 yeah. pounds at full speed. Makes no sense to me. I mean, I, I uh, you can't hit him. I just we could talk, Dan. We could do a podcast about this for four hours, and we still have stuff to talk about afterwards about these damn rules. <laughs> well, I'm on the DL on the golf course until my hernia heals, so I've got those Ooh, four okay. hours. If you want to catch up next week, yeah, it's not a fun one. Oh, but, uh, that's too bad. Yeah, y- yeah I can't imagine yeah. not being able to play golf every day right now. I would go ape shit if I couldn't play golf. <laughs> every day i yeah it's i miss it it's been almost two years since i've really played in earnest um back to devin hester yeah uh, awkwardly when they gave him a contract to make him a wide receiver i i I thought that was a critical error i you know even though he still was returning on occasion because daniel manning was good at it too but that was money wasted wasn't it I mean, you had to pay Devin. I mean, whatever he thought he was worth, he needed to get paid. I, I don't think you could have overpaid him, honestly. I mean, you pay him as a receiver because there was no nothing to compare him to return-wise, right? There's really no contracts that are going to be that big, and he was the best at his position in the NFL. So I guess try and use him. He had some big ga- games receiving. You know, he had some big plays. It wasn't probably what people thought it would be. But, I mean, he, he had some big plays for us in the receiving game, but it just – you had to pay him as, as something. So pay him as receiver so you can pay him more money and justify it, I guess. But he, whatever he got wasn't enough, I'll tell you that much. He, he was unbelievable. He changed the field position for our team. He changed things um, just the way they kicked off to us, the way they had to kick out of bounds, kick it short. Just He did things differently and changed our field position, which we needed for our offense. Yeah, no question about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dave Tobe told me a couple of weeks ago he was one of the guys who went to bat for for Hester. He says, "Yeah, p- pay him whatever it takes. He changes games, and there was 100%. no debating yep. that." I, I hope the Bears, boy, this has got to be something for the Bears bean counters. They, they're probably wondering, man, our expenses in Canton this summer are going to be exorbitant because it is customary for NFL teams to pay for the party for enshrinees. As I see my guests smiling. I had lunch with Jimbo Covert Monday, 
and he confirmed I for me. I saw the Super Bowl this year. Good guy. I like yeah, that. Yeah, he, he confirmed for me the Bears came up a little bit light. He, he didn't bitch about it, but yeah. he, the Bears were not very generous to him for his Hall of Fame party. The custom is to pay for the guy's party, and that's a six-figure right. expense for family and friends. Were they generous to you? The Bears were more than generous for my party. I'll say this. There's been a lot of things that have been said back and forth the last couple of years and things I don't agree with, but they damn sure took care of my party. George was great. Miss McCaskey came to the party after the game. She showed up at 1230 with her, her and George and a bunch of the people on the staff. They came to the party. So they, they were more than generous. and They definitely did right by me when it came to that. Good to hear that. Uh, you know, yeah. you were... It would hard to be, at least my read on it, it would have hard to have been anything but bitter at the end when they basically offered you a minimum league contract. That's not how you treat 13-year veterans who are going to it all wasn't a, It wasn't about the money, Dan. It wasn't about the, It was the way they handled the situation. That's, that's what bothered me. Um, you know, George could have stepped in at any time and said, hey, look, uh, Phil Emery, who's a complete dumbass, by the way. I don't know why they, they fired Jerry and hired this guy, and he screws up everything for the next five or six years for that organization, maybe even longer. Um, didn't know what he was doing, but he had a stance that I wasn't coming back um, for some reason. Well, And you know what? Looking back, I'm so glad I didn't because they fired Lovey anyway, so I didn't want to play for another coach if it wasn't Lovey. But it wasn't about the money. It was the way it was handled by uh, Phil Emery. That's the way. And, and George never stepped in and, and – and he could have, because he's the mm-hmm. team owner. Team, he was, I don't know if he's the president, what he was back then. He could have stepped in and done something about it, but he didn't. So I, I'm glad it worked out the way it did. I'm glad I retired when I did. I'm glad I didn't play for another team. You, you've gotten over whatever bitterness you had, though. You seem like you are today a Bears fan. Am I wrong? Well, I grew up a Dallas Cowboys fan, and I still am. That's my number one team. I, mean, I grew up a Cowboys fan. That's my team. I do watch the Bears when they're on TV down here, uh, but if I have to choose... Number one team, you know, I grew up watching Cowboys on Sundays. I played for the Bears. I worked for them for 13 years, but they're my number two team because Dallas was my team growing up. Okay, Sorry. So That's going to piss some people off, but they'll get over it. Yeah, they or they won't, and hell with Don't them. care either way. Uh, last thing I want to ask you, Brian, and thanks so much for the time. It's been fun. Yeah. Um, it's my contention. If Lovey Smith – could have just found the right offensive coordinator. There would have been at least one Super Bowl ring in your in the you know in the mantle that sits behind you with all of those game balls as we talk today. That that was the difference between your team not winning a Super Bowl, uh, just not having the right guy to coordinate the offense. Is that is that close? Is that how you look at it or no? I don't I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way at all. If we play better on defense to win that Super Bowl, I know that much. If we if we play better uh, against Indy, if we don't give up 250 yards rushing and 250 yards passing, we win that game. So we had three or four takeaways. Our offense played good enough. Thomas had 115 yards, whatever, rushing. But we didn't make enough plays in that game. And, I, and then you got the 2010 NFC Championship game. We lost to Green Bay. Jay gets hurt in the first half. You know, if, if he stays healthy that game, who knows what happens? We don't you can't say we win it, but we may get back to the game, and then who knows? But I, I don't blame coaches. I don't blame anyone else. We, we should have played better. That's the way I look at it. There's no way you can say an OC kept us from winning a game or kept us from winning a Super Bowl. I, I just don't see that being uh, accurate. Okay. Um, they did rush for 191 yards against you, and uh, oh, Manning got the yeah. MVP, even though and you kept know, them under 200. Dan, that's pretty good for us. Kept them under 200 <laughs> in that game. Uh, and that yeah and uh but i i will never forget and uh god it was so exciting to be there my first super bowl as a fan and just the the palpable tension three hours before kickoff just sitting in the stands was amazing i had great seats right behind jerry angelo's wife and daughters and uh is yeah six seats away from jesse jackson the burger king mascot was right there i was surrounded by royalty but uh ron turner calls a pass on second and one in the middle of the third quarter and rex grossman trips over his own two feet and Booger yeah, McFarland so touches him for the first sack of the game. So, and then you're in third and long. God, I wish Ron could have that call back and just give the ball to TJ. There's so many things, uh, you know, how about, okay, we bust the coverage. So we're up seven zero. Devon turns the kick. They, they get the ball back. We kick it off. Uh, Chris Harris gets a pick on third down on their first drive. And then the next we punt it away. The next series we have them on third and 14 
and we bust the coverage and they score. Reggie Wayne scores a touchdown. We, we have a safety play in cover one when it was cover two. That, that if it's a if we're doing the right things, he throws a check down. We make the tackle. We're off the field. There's not nothing happens, but we bust the coverage and then that's that's where that goes. So it's just there's a bunch of plays in that game. Um, there's a there's a fumble we caused that if I pick it up, I score. But I try to jump on it and it goes back and we get the ball. But there's no reason I shouldn't have picked it up and scored. So there's so many small plays in that game that I replay that. If we do this to do that, we win the game easily, but that shit didn't happen. So Well, if anybody out. wearing a jersey number higher than 50 should have tried to pick up the ball, it was you. You had as good of hands as you and Luke Keekley. I often have said uh, for right. linebackers. Yeah, football player too, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just I, I look back at that play. I'm like, why didn't you just pick it up? And, we, and we, Coach always tells us, pick the ball up and run. That was it. We want to score on defense. And my jackass just tried to jump on it. We ended up getting the ball, but uh, next play we turned it over, so it didn't matter. Bears Hall of Famer Brian Erlacher, my guest today, thanking those of you who made this happen on the Bet Rivers Podcast Network. Adam Delavitt is Baby Capone, the big boss man. And Randy Merkin is the guy who takes care of getting all of our guests for us. And we thank Merck as well. Uh, five stars for the Brian Erlacher interview. Sam Michael is the executive producer of the Danny Mac Podcast and also thanking Alex Pastor for everything he does with social media. Have a great weekend. I'm Dan McNeil. See you.